This is a story of a man who calls himself a gamer. The impressionist gamer, if you will. But I think a more accurate description would be something more along the lines of a video game hoarder. Hi, Gamer here. You know, the guy who plays video games. Unlike most gamers, however, who play Fortnite and nothing else, I like to collect video games. Sure, my backlog may be bigger than what my actual room can handle, but a lot of these can hold so much value, stories, memories to share of our experiences with these games. Plus, they make a pretty good presentation prop. While I do have every intention to go through all the games I have to showcase, or... You see a potential game of the year shadow drop right in front of you. And with many other highly anticipated games piling up your backlog, success after success, and what do you do? I don't think people want a Picross episode of all things. Right, now let's start from the beginning. I think what the YouTube algorithm really needs is a little more of NetHack. This is a roguelike game. Finally! Something to kill time with for the weekend. You see, I could be playing the biggest game of the year from AAA Studios, but for every Fire Emblem Engage Special Edition I buy, I go straight back to another round of Mario's Picross. It's not that I don't want to try the other games or don't have time for it, I just never make the time for it. It's not just me though, and I don't blame people for it. Every time I gush about Kojima games like Death Stranding, telling them that it takes a good 10 hour before the game actually clicks isn't the best way to convince anyone to play video games in the first place. People just want a short burst of gaming, like the classic arcade titles, but after beating your own high score? Now what? There's also puzzle games like Tetris, but seriously though, who hasn't played a classic game of Tetris? Wait... Needs a little more action. Well, I got a video game genre for you. What if you play a game where you can endlessly play until you game over, and when you restart at the beginning, everything changes? Your character, loadout, the labyrinth level design, my desire to play Stranger of Paradise for some stupid reason. It's no longer a game of finding a pattern to cheese your way through it. It's a game of getting good. That's where we get roguelike games. Now, the naming can be a little confusing for everyone. I hear some people call it roguelite, roguelike, roguelike-like. Although, let's be real here, the differentiation between the naming is so minimal for me to really put in the effort to categorize the games I actually want to talk about. It's been around longer than you think, tracing all the way back to text-based adventure games, taking inspiration from Dungeons & Dragons. You create your own character, each run is a fresh adventure, and when you game over, restart everything from scratch. NetHack might not sound like the most exhilarating experience that you can get for just being exactly what it sets out to do, but I can guarantee you that with the evolution of the video game industry, it's a stepping stone to offer some of the best craftsmanship in the medium. I want to say that roguelike games didn't truly kick off until the early 2010s, a lot of which ended up being indie classics. That's not to mention how we now have the Nintendo Switch, currently the third best-selling video game console of all time that happens to be a handheld hybrid, which may very well be the best home for the entire roguelike gallery. Seriously, think about it. You play a big game on the TV, take it out to handheld mode, and play a smaller game. Put it back on the dock, and oh shit, why am I still playing this? I myself happen to enjoy a good handful of these games, which means I'll be sharing my thoughts on the Switch roguelike gallery. Obviously, this isn't a comprehensive list of every single roguelike game available, more so just a list of some of my favorite titles in the genre that happens to be playable on Switch. Returnal, on the other hand? You're gonna have to save that for another day. First up, it's surprisingly a card game. Slay the Spire, to be more accurate, is a roguelite, dungeon crawling, card based deck builder. 
Try saying that 10 times fast. Normally, I don't care much about deck building video games, just not my go-to genre in general, especially when I could play more casual card games in person. Except it was one of those games I kept hearing fantastic things about, so I tried it myself and my god, this is amazing. You pick between three distinct characters with their own unique attributes. The Ironclad being a brute soldier with heavy emphasis on strength and high damage output. The Silent is a skilled base assassin with tactical moves to throw as much free daggers and poison damage as possible. My personal favorite, the Defect, is a robot with the ability to channel numerous orbs to either passively attack or defend at the end of a turn, or you can evoke the orbs to double the effectiveness during your turn, which can be so satisfying when you get all the rhythm down. Throughout your dungeon crawling adventures, you use cards in your hand according to the amount of energy you have to either attack, defend, or use whatever special skills you have unique to your character. It plays out like a turn-based RPG, as you play your moves based on what the enemy's next move is. After finishing the battle, you pick a new card to put in your pile and continue onwards, until you reach the end of the stage with a boss battle. While collecting more cards is ideal for having options to work with, it will also come at the cost of the probability of getting the cards you need in some serious battles, as the enemies will become increasingly difficult. Collecting potions can aid you in battle, while collecting relics are more permanent bonuses to carry throughout the entire run. The unknown checkpoints in your map will sometimes bring up goofy scenarios and make classic references, giving a charming, lighthearted tone. Everything surrounding the core gameplay will come across overwhelming initially, especially since this game was originally made for PC with the mouse control in mind. The Switch version does have both button and touch controls, which is convenient modeling after the mobile port of the game. While button controls aren't nearly as obtuse as you think, it's manageable. Once you learn the mechanics of a game, it's extremely addictive. Even after beating the game, you may think it's over, but it's not. Beating the game will unlock a higher level difficulty to play through if you're in for a challenge. Although the main highlight being, once you beat the game as each of the three main characters, you'll unlock keys to acquire in a specific manner in order to play the real ending, which will absolutely destroy you. Oh, and there's also a fourth unlockable character, the Watcher, who's very tough to the master, focusing on using cards to switch stands, giving you equal amount of advantages and risk. I'll admit, the deck building genre is not for everyone. Like I said, I don't even play these types of games myself, but I can guarantee you that Slay the Spire will stand as one of the best in the deck building roguelike genre. Although the majority would probably want something with a little more emphasis on combat. Dead Cells is simply put, the metroidvania of all roguelites. Dare I say it, also one of the best action video games out there. You play as the prisoner, fighting your way out of the castle through labyrinth levels, all of which are procedurally generated in their dedicated biomes. Initial playthroughs are very streamlined towards the end of the game, but with gaining permanent progressions over time, the game would start to branch out to different paths leading to more biomes previously inaccessible, which is where the Metroidvania DNA comes to play. However, the combat mechanics is the real star of what really makes Dead Cells a beast of its own. You start off with a basic starter weapon, but eventually unlock randomized weapons of any kind to start your run with. You have close range melee, long range weapons, and if skillful enough, shields can offer a great line of defense. These weapons come with a wide variety of abilities such as a swift sword causing critical damage while your momentum speed buff is active, blow darts with poison damage and critical from hitting behind, and assault shield for counterattacking enemies while also gaining the dash towards them for advantage. As you progress throughout each biomes, you are required to spend the cells you've collected from killing enemies in exchange to unlock new weapons, abilities, and costumes before you start your next level. Given the variety of over 50 weapons used in the game, you have tons of replay value to experience different combination of weapons that best suits your playstyle. Even then, the weapons being randomized as well gives you more incentive to learn everything and get good at it. It's a simple premise, but with a clear gameplay focus that excels in the long run. I already beat this game 
long time ago, back when it officially launched in 2018. And I'm shocked that they're still adding more content to this day. More biomes, weapons, paid DLC, indie crossovers, Castlevania DLC at that! Featuring remix soundtrack and new weapons based on the series, which is very fitting given the game's inspirations. It's no longer about me trying to beat the game with the harder difficulty, of course, that is the goal with most roguelites. Rather, it's me challenging my skills and enjoying the action platformer as time killer while exploring the new content being provided over the years. This is an expertly crafted indie game that continues to surpass their ambitions. I mean, how can you top an indie crossover like Dead Cells in Castlevania? Okay, I know I'm pushing it a bit in regards to it being a roguelite, but Cadence of Hyrule is definitely up there. It's actually a standalone follow-up to the rhythm dungeon crawler Crypt of the Necrodancer, where you hop around in a grid-based level design and attack to the beat of the music. Personally, I always love a good rhythmic game to go on a beat with, but holy shit, this is unforgiving. I didn't play this as much as I would like to, but I think Cadence of Hyrule was a more balanced experience for me, only this time being a crossover to The Legend of Zelda, which is obviously inspired by A Link to the Past. Along with a new remix soundtrack made specifically for this game, it's wonderful. While this feels more like a traditional Zelda game than anything else on this list, it still carries over some roguelite elements. The entire world map is procedurally generated when starting a new game, with dedicated titles shuffled around, which I didn't realize that until after being the game back when it first came out. Every time you game over, which will still happen a lot, you respawn at the closest checkpoint while losing all of your items, weapons, and currency. Anything that isn't a permanent upgrade. It's still difficult to find that momentum, but like I said, it's far more forgiving than the original title. Especially with accessibility features like removing the requirement to play with the tempo. Or you could be a hardcore enthusiast with a full-blown permadeath mode. I never really hear anyone talk about this hidden gem. It's not often you get an original indie game in collaboration with Nintendo themselves. A Zelda IP at that. If you like rhythm and tempo based games, it's absolutely worth checking out. Plus, it does have a two player mode. Which reminds me, I feel like we should have more dedicated multiplayer roguelike. Then again, I'm a solo player 96% of the time, and I'm pretty sure there's already a handful of multiplayer games that I haven't even played before. Except there's one game that would definitely fit that category. It also happens to have a lot of gun puns. This is pretty straightforward. Procedurally generated dungeon layout? Check. Twin stick shooter in the vein of Smash TV? Check. Two player? co-op? Double check. Dodge rolling around the bullet hell of chaos? Absolutely. An encyclopedia worth of guns ranging from being badass to flat out goofy? You bet. If that doesn't sell it for you, most of the enemies are bullets and grenades themselves. Well no wonder why Devolver published this. They were born to publish pro gun games like this. Despite being a twin stick shooter, it's definitely a bullet hell game at its core, which is what the challenge brings right from the very beginning, especially when you have to manually reload with almost any weapon you use. You can, however, press a button to roll, making you invincible for the duration of the animation, and a limited amount of blanks which rids all of the bullets if things get too crazy. It's also useful to find hidden secrets within each level. You're gonna have to get used to your starting gun, however, because personally, I find it difficult to find the new ones to begin with. Sometimes chests are locked, and you may not even have the keys. Even then, it's completely up in the air whether or not you acquire a good weapon to begin with. Except when you do get a good weapon, that's where the real fun begins. Keep in mind that any new weapons you get will have limited ammo, so you'll have to make your shots count, or keep sharp eye on the ammo refill crate which is exactly why I play as the Marine, for an extra shield and ammo drop when needed. You do get a few character selection with different benefits, 
Although, when activating co-op, the second player is locked to being the cultist, which I thought is an odd choice. Regardless, it's a lot more fun playing co-op compared to any other games I've mentioned. I'm just impressed to see this small little game be turned into a full-blown franchise, as we already got an Apple Arcade sequel called Exit the Gungeon. Not as good as the original, but can't go wrong with it. And House of the Gun Dead Light Gun Arcade Game. Holy shit, Devolver published a brand new indie develop arcade game in 2023? I've completely forgotten about this because this was announced back in E3 2019. I wasn't sure about it actually releasing in the first place, except it's actually real and local arcades are getting it right now. I legitimately thought that was the coolest thing Devolver has ever done, which is literally the reason why I brought up this game. Now, of all roguelike games I've mentioned, nothing can compare to one indie title being able to take it to the next level. Hades single-handedly redefined how video games narratives can be told through a genre not commonly known for having much of a story to begin with. If you think about it, it's fascinating how this indie masterpiece happens to drop right before we got Returnal seven months later, which that was made on a AAA budget level. It's so good, it brought in gamers who normally doesn't enjoy roguelike games to begin with to actually beat this game. The game itself, ironically, you don't actually play as Hades, but his son, Zagreus, who's attempting to fight his way out of the underworld. Of course, every time you die, you're taken straight back to the very beginning at the House of Hades. The pacing is exceptional, as you could easily sink half an hour from the action gameplay, and when you game over, you take a breather talking to any characters for important conversations to get invested in at your own pace. All of which is surprisingly voice acted. Not only that, but there's so much dialogue in this game, I've never experienced any repeats. And even if there was, it's so infrequent, you wouldn't even notice long after being the game. I see you've decided to come home. Changed your mind yet? Or looking for more pain and suffering? More pain and suffering for sure. After all, you taught me to appreciate the finer things. Most roguelites would have simple plots to set the background for the core gameplay. Instead, the narrative of Hades takes advantage of the roguelike genre itself in order to tell a story unlike anything else in the medium, even after beating the game. The conclusion is the game telling you why this blends into the roguelike genre so perfectly, convincing you to do it all over again. The gameplay itself? Oh, oh boy, it's a perfectly balanced game. You start with a regular sword, but over time unlock more weapons to use throughout your run, and as you encounter each of the gods of Olympus, they offer you a randomized selection of abilities tailored to their attributes. Your time spent playing the game is you experimenting with the combinations of the weapon you're using and the attributes you come across with that could potentially suit you for completing the run. While I do think I would enjoy replaying Dead Cells more for the sheer variety of weapons and locales to go through, then again, that's probably why we're getting a sequel heading to Early Access later this year, which is surprising to say the least. Nonetheless, Hades is a well-rounded experience for incorporating the narrative into the action roguelike gameplay, and does so flawlessly. Whew! Alright. Finally got all that out of my system. So, probably just put that to the side and you know what? I'll probably go on Game Pass, find some titles that I've been wanting to play. I just want to play. Oh, 
Oh my god. I just figured out what's preventing me from talking about video games. It's me getting sucked into this endless rhythm of roguelike games, not on Switch, but on all platforms. Like I said earlier, it's not like I don't have the time. I don't make the time for anything because of this. With games like this, I just end up capturing endless amount of footage without actually putting them into good use. What for exactly? Well, for example, I'm trying to edit a YouTube video talking about my favorite roguelite video games that you can play on the Nintendo Switch. Considering that I have to cover multiple games here, it takes a lot more time to write everything, film, put everything together through editing, but at the end of the day... Son of a bitch. There's too many distractions! That also doesn't help that there was a couple more games I haven't even mentioned yet. Downwell is a cool vertical arcade style game. Inscription is amazing. Think the deck building gameplay of Slay the Spire, but with an exceptional narrative. Does it mean I might have something like ADHD? I don't know. We all get distracted, that's for sure. Except I procrastinate, and when I procrastinate, I keep thinking of too many great ideas that I want to talk about. Spider-Man 2 or the PSVR 2. You get the idea. That's the part where I multitask. Mostly due to the fact that it was the game that innovated realistic web-slinging mechanics, and the rest of the games afterwards didn't quite reach that high bar. And when I multitask, I start to realize that there's just too much for me to handle, or I just simply haven't gotten good enough yet. So... Ah, oh, damn it. Alright. Let's try something a little bit different. Sometimes I just want an experience, unlike any other games, proving itself that video games can be a work of art, breaking boundaries to tell an engrossing narrative which can hold the test of time and widespread to a bigger audience who are willing to see it through, or a simply fantastic game that'll hook you from the very beginning, seeking into the engaging atmosphere and core gameplay loop, which also happens to redefine how video games can be made for the future of modern gaming. Ironically, these are remakes and remasters to the greatest video games of all time, which I've already played the original years ago. I should definitely stop meandering and actually finish my video for once. I'm really falling behind schedule here. But then again, does it really matter if I have a schedule to begin with? Ah. I'll make use of what I have and publish something. Oh shit, that was the wrong video.